Da er det på tide med det siste foredraget for i dag. Det er fra Nick Cooney. Han er fra USA. Gjester nå Oslo som en del av sin Europa-turné, hvor han holder dette foredraget som han skal dele med oss her i dag. Nick er forfatter av boken Change of Heart, som handler om hva psykologien kan lære oss om å skape en sosial forandring. Han har også utgitt en ny bok i år som heter Veganomics, The Surprising Science on What Motivates Vegetarians, From the Breakfast Table to the Bedroom. Nick er dessuten grunnleggeren og leder av den amerikanske dyrevernsorganisasjonen The Humane League. Nicks presentasjon tar utgangspunkt i flere spørsmål som dyrevernerne stiller. Et spørsmål er hvorvidt dyrevernerne bør bruke sterke bilder av lidende dyr eller milde bilder av glade dyr for å formidle sitt budskap mest effektivt. Han skal peke på en del enkle teknikker som kan doble sannsynligheten for at folk vil bruke tid på frivillig dyrevernsarbeid. Og han diskuterer også hva slags budskap som har hatt størst effekt for å påvirke folk til å spise mer vegetarisk og vegansk mat. Everybody give a round of applause for Nick Cooney. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I know that you've been here a while, so hopefully this will be as entertaining and interesting as possible. And to start, I wanted to say that I am indeed from the United States, and we are not nearly as smart as you Norwegians. We can pretty much only speak one language, including myself. So thank you very much for bearing with a talk in English here tonight. So I am going to talk about the science of animal advocacy. And what exactly do I mean by that? Well, to start, I want to go back in time over 2,000 years to the year 300 BC. It's around that time that the practice that we now know as alchemy first got its start. Now today, if we think of alchemists, we probably picture old men trying to turn lead into gold, and indeed, that was one of the goals of the alchemists. And today, in 2013, we can look back at what they were doing, and we can see it as silly and foolish, but in its time, it was taken very seriously. There were schools you could go to to learn alchemy, the government licensed alchemists, and so forth. And alchemy was around for over 2,000 years until the 1700s and 1800s, at which point it was replaced by chemistry. You may have noticed the names have a little something in common. And whereas alchemy was basically a 2,000 year exercise in futility that accomplished nothing of value for humankind, chemistry in just the past few hundred years has achieved all sorts of things that have improved and extended human life. For example, if you enjoy having access to life-saving medication, if you like wasting time on your smartphone, if you enjoy having fresh water come out of your tap every morning, and if you like getting to ride around in the car with your friends, you can thank chemistry in part for every one of these things. Now, what is the difference between chemistry and alchemy? Why did one succeed where the other was such a dramatic failure? And perhaps most importantly of all, why am I standing up here at an animal rights event talking about chemistry? Well, let me answer all those questions. First, the difference between chemistry and alchemy. The difference is a very simple one, but it's also a very fundamental one. And it's one that we probably all learned back in elementary school. And the difference is the scientific method. Chemists do use and did use the scientific method Alchemists did not. Now, for those of us who haven't been in elementary school in a while, just as a little reminder, the scientific method is basically all about testing. So if you want to assert that something is true, you better be able to do the testing that shows that it is, in fact, true. In fact, if we look up the definition of the word science itself on Wikipedia, it will tell us in the very first line that science builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable, explanations and predictions. Now, it's probably easy for us to understand the importance of science and research when it comes to those hard sciences, things like chemistry or biology or physics, but testing and research are actually being used in all corners of our society today to advance human understanding and achievement. For example, back in the United States, our president, Barack Obama, was re-elected last year 
despite the fact that the American economy was in one of the worst states it had been in in over 70 years. And one of the things that the media pointed to as the reason that he was able to win re-election was his campaign's use of research and testing. He hired a team of 50 data analysts who did nothing but use research to figure out which voters were most likely to be undecided about who to vote for and what messages would be most likely to get them to vote for him. Right. So that's politics. How about business? Businesses, for-profit companies, spend tens of billions of euros every year on market research to figure out what products to sell, what features to have, who to advertise to, and so on and so forth. They spend all this time and money because it works. It helps them succeed at what they are trying to do, which is, of course, to sell as many products as possible. So that's business, that's politics. But, you know, research and testing are also starting to be used in the nonprofit world as well. For example, one very pressing human health issue is the spread of malaria, a disease that still kills about 5 million people every year. Now, there's a number of nonprofits working to fight malaria, and one thing they do is they give away these mosquito nets, which keep mosquitoes away while you're sleeping at night, because mosquitoes are often the way that malaria is transmitted to human beings. So that was all well and good, but these nonprofits had a question. Because some were just giving the nets away for free, under the idea that if everyone had a net, that would be the best way to combat malaria. But some other nonprofits felt that no, the better thing to do was to charge a really small price for these nets, something that basically everyone could afford, under the idea that if people paid even a small amount for the net, they would now be personally invested in it and more likely to use it, and so it would work better. So some nonprofits were doing it one way, some the other, and no one really know, knew which approach was better for fighting malaria. So some researchers came in and they did a little scientific test. They tested one approach versus the other, and they found out that it was, in fact, giving the nets away for free that worked better, that saved more lives. So simply by adding a little bit of science and testing and research to the work they were already doing, these nonprofits were now able to save even more lives for the same amount of time and the same amount of energy. Now, we're not here tonight to talk exactly about improving the human condition, but we are here to talk about improving the situation for animals. Can we animal advocates, can we use the same types of research and testing that are being used in business and politics and elsewhere in the nonprofit world? Can we use these tools to be more effective at the work that each one of us is doing for animals? Well, if we think about what any of us are trying to accomplish for animals, any of us as individuals, or any of the organizations here tonight. If we want to succeed, pretty much anything we're trying to do, if we want to succeed, it requires doing one single thing. And that is changing, changing human behavior. Right? So whether that's getting members of the public to go vegan, whether it's getting politicians to vote in support of animal-friendly laws, whether it's getting companies, the heads of companies, to change their policies to become more animal friendly. Every one of these requires changing human beliefs and, most importantly, changing human behavior. Now, there's some things that we as a movement, that we as the animal advocacy movement, sometimes tell ourselves that sound good, that feel good, but that aren't necessarily true. For example, sometimes we tell ourselves that our movement will succeed because we're on the side of compassion. There's a quote from the United States that we often hear from Martin Luther King, the civil rights campaigner, in which he states that the arc of the moral universe is long, but ultimately it bends toward justice. Those are very comforting, very inspiring words. Sometimes we tell ourselves that we'll succeed as a movement because we really care about animals, or will succeed if we just work very hard. Now, every one of these things is going to help us succeed. But these things alone do not guarantee that we will succeed in bringing about the world we want to see for animals. Because if we look back through history, and if we look around the world today, we see that far too often, those who are on the side of compassion, those who cared a lot, 
those who worked really hard did not succeed. They failed, or they are failing right now. So while all of these things will help, they alone do not guarantee that we'll succeed at, again, changing behavior and thereby saving the lives of animals. So I think that we as a movement will succeed to the extent that we learn what really motivates people to change, to change their beliefs and their behaviors. And so psychology research can really be a roadmap to changing individual behavior and to changing society as a whole. And just as we wouldn't get into the car and drive to a new city we've never been to before without first getting the directions of how to get from point A to point B, it would also be presumptuous of us as animal advocates to think that we can steer members of the public from attitude A to attitude B or behavior A to behavior B without us first taking the time to learn the directions of what works for steering people and their behavior in a more compassionate direction. So I think that we as the animal advocacy movement, we really have two choices. Just as the alchemists, believed they could turn lead into gold, despite the fact that there was no scientific research to show that that was in fact the case. We can assume that we already know the best messages to inspire the public to care about animals and to act on that compassion. Or, like the chemists, we can insert the scientific method into the good work we are already doing to become even more effective for animals. And one of the reasons that latter approach is so important is that our assumptions about what motivate people's behavior and beliefs are often incorrect. And I want to give you one example from the research on this. I'm going to be citing a number of studies here tonight. Some come directly from the field of animal protection. Some come from other fields. But all of them are studies that are very useful to the work that we are doing. So in this particular study, some environmental researchers wanted to figure out how, what would the best way was to get homeowners to reduce the amount of energy they were using in their homes? So what they did is they created four different booklets. The first one spoke about the environmental reasons to conserve. The second, about the financial reasons. The third spoke about the benefits to the community. And the fourth said that many people in that town were already conserving. Researchers then went around to homes in one particular neighborhood, and they left just one booklet at each house. They then worked with the local utility company to monitor the actual energy usage in these homes over the next three months. And of all four of these booklets, which one would you guess was most effective at getting people to actually reduce their energy usage? Who would guess the first one with the environmental message? Oh, jaded crowd. Who would guess the second one with the financial, the money you could save? All right. Anyone the third, benefits to the community? And how about the fourth one? Other people are doing it. All right, so we kind of got a split house here tonight. You know, it turned out that of all four of these booklets, only one actually got people to reduce their home energy usage. And it was, in fact, the fourth one, the one that simply said other people were already doing it. Now, if I was an environmental campaigner here in Norway, and I was trying to get homeowners to reduce their energy usage, chances are I would use an environmental message because, after all, I am an environmental advocate. Or maybe I would try to also appeal to people's financial self-interest. The point is that our assumptions about what works for changing people's behaviors and, as we'll see later, their beliefs as well, our assumptions about what will work are often incorrect, which is why when it comes to the practical decisions we make as animal advocates, we need to look not to philosophy or guesses or assumptions, we need to look simply at what works. What works and what doesn't for changing beliefs and behaviors. Now, thankfully for all of us, if we were to go to our local university library, we would find thousands and thousands and thousands of peer-reviewed academic studies showing what works and what doesn't for changing beliefs and behaviors. And perhaps to some of you, the idea of sitting and reading thousands of academic studies sounds like a fun time. <laughs> but I imagine to most of us, that's kind of a scary proposition, right? No need to worry, though. I've tried to do as much of this boring reading as possible and put it into this book, Change of Heart, What Psychology Can Teach Us About Spreading Social Change.
I also have the new book called Veganomics, which looks at all the research specific to vegetarians and vegans. And so what I'm going to do with the rest of my time tonight is I'm going to share what I think are some of the most important points from these bodies of research. And by most important, I mean things that we can use in our own lives and in our own advocacy to be more effective advocates for animals. All right, so to get started. First, some tools we can use to be more effective at getting people to care and getting people to change. All right, first, stories versus statistics. So if we are talking to a friend, a family member, a member of the public about factory farming and vegan eating, which one of these is gonna be more effective? Talking about an individual animal and what life is like for her or him? Talking about how big the problem is and how many millions of animals suffer? Or doing a combination of the two? Well. <laughs> Some researchers wanted to put this to the test. Now, they were not animal activists, so they focused on another serious issue, the issue of starvation in Africa. And they created three fundraising letters. The first one spoke about how big the problem was, how many tens of millions of people were dying of starvation each year. The second letter didn't have any of that. It just had the story of one young African girl and what life was like for her as a child facing starvation. And the third letter had both. It had the statistics about how many people were suffering and starving, but it also had the story of that young African girl. So the letters were sent out asking people to donate, the donations came back in, and at the end of the day, which letter would you think was most effective at getting people to donate, most effective at putting food in the mouths of hungry people? Who would guess the first one with the statistics? Second one with the story? third one with both the story and the statistics. All right, again, we got about half and half. So it turned out that one of these letters was about twice as effective as either of the other two. And it was the second one, the one that only had the story. And as we can see, the letter that had both the story and the stats did only slightly better than the one that just had the statistics. Now, you know, if we human beings were logical creatures, Hearing that tens of millions of people are starving should make us donate more money than hearing that one person is starving. But we are, as we all know, not necessarily the most logical or rational animals out there. And so stories are more powerful. Stories are very powerful. They inspire us to be more compassionate and to act. One other example of the power of stories. There was a university professor who wanted his class, or had his class, design and give presentations about a topic of each of their own choosing. After all the students had given their talks that day, he polled this class to see what they remembered of one another's talks. And what he found is that of the facts presented that day, only 5% were remembered by the rest of the class. But of the stories presented that day, a full 60% were remembered by the rest of the class. So not only are stories emotionally powerful, they're also sticky. They stick in our mind and they can influence us on an ongoing basis. So what does this mean for us as animal advocates? Well, because we know how many animals suffer and how bad the problem is, we're often tempted to talk about how big the problem is. But what this research suggests is that we'll be more effective by focusing on individual animals and talking about what life is like for one of them on a day-to-day -day basis, on a factory farm, a fur farm, or wherever they may be. The more we tell stories of individuals, the more effective we'll be at getting people to care and getting people to change. All right, moving on, the best request. You know, most of us want the most we can get out of life, right? We want the most success, we want the most pleasure, and we want the world to change as much as possible in a direction that helps animals. But what is the best request we should make of the public? For example, let's say, hypothetical situation, let's say tomorrow I was going into a university class here in town and I was gonna talk to an average class, maybe a history class, about factory farming and vegan eating and the ethics of, of how we live our life and what we eat. At the end of the class, what should I encourage all these students to do? Now, if I encourage them to do exactly what I would like them to do, and exactly what I think ethically they should do, I would have first, of course, encourage them all to go vegan. 
I would encourage all of them to become full-time animal rights activists for the rest of their life. Right? I would encourage them to donate every dollar they had to animal rights work, to only eat organic food, to not drive a car, and so on and so forth. But chances are, if I encourage them to do all these things, which I think they should do, they would think that I was crazy and they would not do anything at all, right? So I could ask for everything I want, make that big request. Or maybe I could make a small request, something very easy that most people could do. Or I could ask for something in between. So which one of these types of requests, small, medium, or large, would you think is most effective at creating the greatest amount of behavior change, doing the greatest amount of good for animals? Who would guess a small change, encouraging a small change is best? All right. Who would guess a medium change? Who would guess a large change? All right. So I hate to break it to you, but you're, almost all of you are wrong on this one. So now, of course, of course, small, medium, and large are all relative terms. But researchers have found that, by and large, it is kind of a medium range request that is most effective. And specifically, it's encouraging people to make a change that is significant, but that they could probably picture themselves doing. If they can't picture themselves doing it, it's probably too large of a request, and very few people will make the change. On the other hand, if it's a very small, easy request, yes, maybe a lot of people will do it. But because it's such a small change, you haven't created a large amount of total behavior change. Now, what does this mean for us as animal advocates, specifically as advocates of vegan eating? Well, if we look to surveys, both in Europe and back in the United States, we see that the vast majority of the public cannot, right now, picture themselves going vegan. The vast majority of the public thinks that vegan eating is over, overly restrictive and unhealthy. In fact, a study this year in the United States, where veganism is certainly catching on, a study this year in the United States found that over 50% of vegetarians think that veganism is unhealthy and overly restrictive. So not even most vegetarians could picture themselves being vegan. Also, a, a lot of people in society would have trouble picturing themselves being vegetarian, maybe less so among teenagers and university students. But virtually everyone in our society, or most people, could picture themselves eating less meat. So my assumption, my assumption based on this research, is that probably the best request that will create the most behavior change, the most diet change, spare the most animals, is that most of the time, for the general public, the best request is encouraging them to do something between eating less meat and going vegetarian, at least initially, that that will probably create the most diet change. One other thing for us to keep in mind when we consider you know, what requests we're making of the public when it comes to what they eat is this. Not all farm animals suffer in equal amounts for the average meat eater. Now, this chart I'm going to show you, this is data from the United States. So it's not exactly the same here, but the general ratio is the same. So let me explain. What I tried to do is I tried to figure out, for the average omnivore, how many days of farm animal suffering do they cause with their diet? So for example, in the United States, if the average meat eater eats about 30 chickens a year, and the average chicken lives about 40 days, I did 30 times 40 equals 1,200 days of chicken suffering that the average meat eater causes. And I did the same for all the main categories of animal products that Americans eat. Now again, this is from the US, but the ratios here in Norway are very similar. And what we see is that the vast majority of suffering that the average omnivore causes are caused to farm-raised fish and chickens, either chickens raised for meat or chickens raised for eggs. Over 95% of the suffering, of the days of suffering that the average omnivore cause are caused to chicken and fish for the very simple but sad reason that they're small. A chicken, a fish might weigh four pounds, five pounds. The average cow, 2,000 pounds. The average pig, many hundreds of pounds. And so the unfortunate grisly reality is that people can get many, many meals out of one cow and very few meals out of chickens or fish, which is why when we look to the number of animals people eat and the days of suffering those animals suffer, the vast majority of the number and the vast majority of suffering are farm-raised fish and chickens. So what I take from this is that if we're talking 
to a friend, a family member, a member of the public, and they are not willing to go vegan. And they are not willing to go vegetarian. But they might be willing to take a first step in that direction. The probably one of the best first steps we could encourage them to take is just cutting out chicken, or maybe cutting out chicken and farm-raised fish. Not only is that a step in the right direction, but if they take that step, they can spare a huge amount of the suffering that they would otherwise be causing. Okay, so moving on. The next tool I want to talk about is called foot in the door, and we'll have some questions at the end. It is in the new one, Veganomics. Yep. So foot in the door is something probably you could, uh, some of you can guess what this is all about just from the picture, but I'm going to give an example of a study that will make pretty clear what foot in the door is all about. So there were some researchers uh, in the U.S. in this study who went around the homes in one particular town and they knocked on doors and said, hi, we're promoting safe driving in the community and we wondered if you would put this yard sign up in your front yard. But because the signs were not all that attractive, only about 20% of homeowners agreed to and did put the signs out in their front yards. Researchers then went to other homes in the same neighborhood, but this time they brought with them little five centimeter by five centimeter window stickers that also said, drive safely. Left the yard signs at home. Knocked on doors, said, hey, we're promoting safe driving and we were hoping you would put this window sticker up. And because it was such an easy thing to do, virtually everyone agreed to and did put up these window stickers. Now, three weeks later, researchers went back to the same homes that had gotten those little window stickers. Knocked on doors, said, hey, it's me again. Thank you so much for putting up that sticker. And now we wondered if you would put this yard sign out in your front yard. And this time, not 20%, but 70% agreed to and did put the yard signs out in their front yard. So in other words, even though the main goal of researchers was to get these yard signs out in the front yards, they were much more effective at doing so by first making a similar but smaller request that people were likely to say yes to, waiting for a little time to pass, and then going back and making their second real larger request. There are literally over 1,000 studies documenting the power of the the foot-in-the-door approach. And I want to give you just two other really quick examples now. So in another study, people asked to sign a petition to support the building of a recreation center for the physically handicapped. The next week, donated twice as much money to that building as people who were never even asked to sign the petition. Similarly, people asked to wear a little pin promoting the Canadian Cancer Society. The next week, donated, again, about twice as much money as people who were never even asked to wear the pin in the first place. Why would this work? You know, why would putting up a little sticker or signing a petition or putting on a pin, why would that make us more likely to take a larger, significant step for that cause? Well, the reason that researchers think foot in the door is so powerful is that it influences our sense of self-identity. So if someone asked me to wear a pin for the Canadian Cancer Society, you know, maybe I've never thought about cancer. I don't know. Maybe I never know anyone. I've never known anyone who had it. I don't, you know, never thought about it a day in my life. But I know that the polite thing to do is, sure, like I'll wear the pin, I'll put it on. Once I have put on that pin, I start to think of myself, at least subconsciously, as I guess I'm the sort of person who cares about fighting cancer. Otherwise, why would I have put on this little pin, right? So now that we start to think of ourselves in that way, when someone asks us to donate, to volunteer, to get involved, we are much more likely to say yes because it's consistent with how we see ourselves. So what does this mean for us as animal advocates? Well, there are are some animal advocates who have the belief that we should always and only promote veganism because that is, of course, what we would like the public to do, go vegan. And their concern is that if we encourage people to do anything less, whether it's eat less meat, go vegetarian, anything less than veganism, that yes, they may do that. They may go vegetarian, but they'll become complacent. They'll think that's good enough. They'll stop there. And they won't ultimately go on to do what we would like them to do, which is, of course, to go vegan. Now, this is a very understandable concern. But thankfully, thankfully, if we look to the research, we see that people who make a small change become more likely 
to make a similar larger change down the line. And we see this also specifically to vegetarian and vegan eating. Surveys of people who are eating less meat, so for example, in the US, there's a program called Meatless Monday where people cut out meat one day a week. Surveys of people who, surveys show that people who are eating less meat now are much more interested and have much more of an intention to go vegetarian when compared to the general public. People who are vegetarian in surveys are much more interested in and have much more of an intention to go vegan compared to the general public. So thankfully, you know, we as animal advocates, as advocates of vegan eating, we are free to tailor our message to our audience and make the best request of them. Right? You know, ironically, ironically, if we look at all this research, it seems that the way to create the most vegans and even the most vegetarians is probably not to always and only or even usually promote veganism. Probably the way to create the most vegans is by usually encouraging the general public to do something less, something in that range of meat reduction to vegetarian. All right, next tool I want to talk about is social norms. Okay, so, you know, we all like to think of ourselves as these bold, independent creatures who have the beliefs we have and who live the lives we live because we've thought about it and we've decided, you know what, this is who I am, this is what I believe, and this is how I'm going to live my life, right? That's how we like to think of ourselves. But the reality is that at heart, we're all just like everyone else. And we are very influenced by what other people are doing, either other people in general or at least other people in our social and peer group. As a result of this, so-called social norms messages, messages which basically say, hey, lots of people are doing this thing, are often very effective at getting us to change. We saw this earlier in the study on home energy usage, and I want to give you just one other example from the research. So there was a hotel chain that wanted their guests to start reusing the bath towels instead of demanding a new bath towel each night. Now, their main reason was financial. Uh, if people wanted a new towel every night, there would be more laundry to do. So more water, more electricity, more staff to do the laundry, and so on and so forth. It would cost them more money. But it would also be good for the environment if people reused their bath towels. Less water, less electricity. So what they did is they went around and they put little signs up in every room in the hotel that basically said, in order to help us protect the environment, we encourage you to please reuse your bath towels. And you know what? The signs did work. Some people did start reusing their towels, but researchers thought that they could do a little bit of a better job. So they teamed up with the hotel, they took out all of those old signs, and they put new signs in every room that had just one sentence printed on them. Most guests in this hotel reused their bath towels, right? It said nothing about helping the environment. And switching from that environmental to the social norms message, increased tower use by about 25%. And in fact, when the signs were made even more specific, so they said most guests in room 309, or whatever room it was, reused their towels, tower use increased even further. <laughs> we're a really smart species, aren't we? <laughs> so what does this mean for us as, again, advocates of vegan eating? Well, of course, we want to talk to the public about the cruelty that farm animals go through. And of course, we want to talk about the health benefits of moving towards vegan eating. But what this research shows is that if we also add in a social norms message, we can be more effective. So if we talk about the growing number of vegetarians and vegans and meat reducers, the growing availability of vegan food in restaurants and grocery stores, if we point out the latest celebrity or politician or athlete who has gone vegetarian or gone vegan, we will make other people more likely to pay attention and to make these same compassionate changes themselves. Now, one other consequence of social norms and the fact that we are influenced by other people is this. We are much more likely to be influenced by people who are similar to us or who we perceive as similar to us. So studies have found that the more similar we are to our audience in terms of things like age and gender and the clothing we wear, our political beliefs, our social beliefs, whether or not we smoke, even the way we speak, the more similar we are to our audience in any of these areas, the more likely we will be to persuade them to change their beliefs and their behaviors. So what does this mean for us as animal advocates? Well, what it means is that you know, of course, we're going to be on we always want to be honest, and of course, we're going to be ourselves. But if we want to be as effective as possible 
at getting people to care about animals, then we should probably tailor ourselves and our approach at least a little bit based on the audience we are addressing. So, for example, if we are doing uh, outreach tabling at a punk concert, we probably want to look one way. And if we're doing it at a conference of conservative politicians, we probably want to dress and speak in a slightly different way if we want to be as effective as possible. One goal that we should have of every interaction that we have with the public about animal issues is this. One of our goals should be that when they walk away from the conversation, when the conversation's over, that they walk away thinking, you know what, that person is just like me, but they don't eat animals, or they're against fur, or whatever the case may be. That's interesting. The more we leave them feeling that, the more likely they will be to seriously consider what we have to say and to actually make these changes. Now, when it comes to focusing our message to our audience, there's one other thing that we should keep in mind, and that is that different groups in society are much more likely to care about animal issues, much more likely to, say, go vegetarian or go vegan. By focusing our efforts on these people, we can do much more good for animals. For example, by focusing on the people who are more likely to go vegetarian, by directing our outreach towards them, we can create many more vegetarians, many more vegans, for the same amounts of time and money and energy. So what are those groups in our society who are more likely to make this change? Well, it's not too surprising. The first one is women. In studies from around the world, the number of female vegetarians and vegans outnumbers the number of male vegetarians and vegans by at least a two to one ratio. In many cases, by a three to one ratio. Second, also not surprising, young people. Those between the ages of 15 and 30 are much more likely to go vegetarian or go vegan than those of other generations. So the more we focus our vegetarian vegan advocacy on women, young people, and best of all, young women, the more effective we will be. We can create twice as many vegetarians and vegans and meat reducers for the same amount of time and money and energy just by focusing on those groups. Okay, the last tool I want to talk about is showing them how. You know, because we know, because we know how much farm animals suffer and how bad animal agriculture is in many respects, we spend so much time telling people why they should change. So why it's good for animals, why it's good for the environment, why it's good for health, why it's good for social justice, why, why, why. But we don't spend nearly enough time showing people how to make these changes that we would like them to make. And you know, I think the reason for this is that when we've been doing something for a long time, it starts to feel very easy to us. And we, we forget that things that seem easy to us because we've been doing them for a long time can seem almost impossible to someone who has never done them before. Right? So of course we need to leave people wanting to go vegan and thinking it's the right thing to do, but we also need to leave people feeling like they know how to make those changes. There was a really interesting study that came out about four or five years ago that was a meta-analysis that looked at over 200 other studies on behavior change. And what this analysis wanted to figure out is, what is the best predictor of whether or not people will actually change their behavior? Now, not surprisingly, it found that attitude mattered. So people who wanted to make a change and thought it was a good change to make, they were more likely to make that change. Not surprising, but here was the surprise. That was not the best predictor of whether or not people actually changed their behavior. The biggest predictor was whether or not they felt they had the ability to make that change. So we need to leave people again, not only wanting to make this change, but feeling like they know how to do it, like they know how to go vegetarian, how to go vegan. And if we look to the research, we see that there are four main barriers that the public sees between them and going vegetarian or going vegan. Four main how barriers that we as animal advocates need to address. So here they are. So first and biggest, taste. Taste. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know how anyone could look at a block of cold, wet, gelatinous tofu and not think that that is the most delicious, mouth-watering thing they have ever seen in their life. But apparently, you know, some people don't agree, and they think that vegan food, they have the perception vegan food doesn't taste good, they don't want to give up the foods and flavors they know and love. So that's the biggest barrier. Second, health. 
A growing number of people do see vegetarian or vegan eating as healthy, but many people still think that it is unhealthy. And the biggest health concern that people have, especially among young people, is one that probably many of us have heard before, and that is where to get enough protein as a vegetarian or vegan. All right, third. Third, how barrier is convenience. People feel they don't know where to buy vegan food, how to prepare it. And fourth, and finally, social issues. People worry that if they are the only vegetarian or vegan in their group and they're going out to eat with friends, that it could be awkward or there might not be anything to eat, so on and so forth. So if we want people to actually make these changes, save the lives of animals, we need to show them how to do these things. You know, how to find really delicious vegan food, maybe how to prepare it, a couple of simple health tips on how to be as healthy as possible as a vegetarian or vegan, and maybe some advice on how to navigate these sometimes tricky social situations. This is important not just for getting more people to go vegetarian or go vegan, it's also important for helping those who are already vegetarian or vegan continue to have those more compassionate diets. Because the unfortunate reality is that if we look to the research, we see that for every four people who go vegetarian, at least three of them will eventually go back to eating meat. At least three out of every four. And the main reasons they do, if you ask them, are the same four reasons. They feel their health was suffering, they missed the taste of meat, they thought it was inconvenient, they had problems with the social issues. So the more we show people how to deal with these how issues, the more we'll create new vegetarians and vegans and keep people eating those diets. Now, I'm getting closer to being close to being done, but before I wrap up, you know, I've been talking for the last half hour or so about other people's psychology and about tools we can use to inspire other people to care and to change their behaviors. But I want to talk for a few minutes about our own psychology and how our own psychology can either help or hurt our efforts at bringing about that world we want to see for animals. You know, it can sometimes be difficult to face ourselves and to face our true motivations for doing the work that we do as animal advocates. For example, I'm sure all of us are here tonight because, primarily because we care about animals and we want them to stop being killed, we want to end the suffering and the injustice. But probably we also have personal motivations for being involved as well. For example, we may have the motivation of wanting to be ourselves and express our beliefs. It's a pretty natural human tendency to want to let the world know what we think and what we feel about issues that are important to us. We may also want to have fun, you know, go to events that are interesting or entertaining or inspiring or that our friends are going to be at. And probably all of us have the motivation of wanting to feel good, of wanting to feel like our lives have added meaning because we're standing up for what we believe in and we're making the world a better place. Now, all of these are well and good. You know, all of these are a, a normal part of being a happy, healthy human being. But we have to recognize the simple fact that sometimes those personal motivations can conflict with our other, more altruistic motivation of wanting to do what works best for animals. Right? And I want to give you a couple examples of that. So um, think back for a second to that hypothetical situation where tomorrow I'm going to go in and give a talk about factory farming and vegan eating to this regular university class, right? I'm going to show you on the next slide two pictures of myself, one from this year, I think you'll recognize me, and one from about 10 years ago. And I want you to tell me which me, which Nick, do you think would be more effective at getting these students to listen, to care, and to move towards being vegan? Which one? It's a little hard to see. You know, it would be great if we lived in a world where people did not judge one another based on appearance. I could look the way I wanted to, if I still wanted to, right? But the reality that we know from our own experience, and also if we look to the research, is that people do judge one another very much based on appearance. And that those who have a more mainstream appearance, a more conventionally mainstream appearance, are more effective at persuading the mainstream public to change their beliefs and to change their behaviors. And now, again, it's not, you know, obviously in our own life, we don't want to play into this, we don't want to judge people based on their looks, but it is a simple and unavoidable fact that if we are active animal activists, getting out there, volunteering, doing things, interacting with the public, that it's a simple fact that having one appearance versus another can mean the difference between sparing thousands 
of additional animals from a lifetime of misery. And for anyone in here who might be thinking about this themselves, it took me four or five years to just you know, go ahead and make the change. But what did it for me was I thought, you know, if my mom were the one that was going to be killed, and I knew that by having a certain appearance, I would have a 20%, 30% better chance of saving her life, of course, I would do it, right? So if I would do it for that one person, then I really should do the same if it would help me spare hundreds, thousands of other individuals. Okay, moving on. What about our interactions with other people? So let's say that uh, this weekend I am volunteering and doing some, some vegan advocacy on the street, you know, passing out booklets or doing an information stall, and someone stops and they want to talk to me. And they're not vegetarian, they're not vegan, but they're willing to listen to what I have to say. What is going on in the back of my mind as I start to talk to this person about factory farming and vegan eating? Am I thinking that I need to tell them that if they care about animals, they have to go vegan and that they can spare 30 animals a year by going vegan and male chicks are ground up alive by the egg industry and pigs are confined in cages so small they can't turn around? I know there's no such thing as humane meat or you know cage-free. It's all really bad. And by the way, if you care about climate change, you need to go vegan as well. It's the best thing to do. And you add five years onto your life and on and on and on. Or... In the back of my mind, am I thinking, who is this person in front of me, and what can I say, and how can I say it, that's going to be most likely to get them to do what I would like them to do, which is care about animals and change their diet in a way that saves the lives of animals. Those are two fundamentally different approaches. The first one is focused on expressing what I believe, what I want, and what I know, and the second starts with the end goal in mind, and it works backward from there. And of course, it's that second approach that's going to be more effective at getting people to care and getting people to change. And one thing this means is that if we want to be effective animal advocates, when we're interacting with the public, we need to use those good social skills that we have developed and used in other places in our life. So the same social skills we would use to get a job we really wanted, to get a date we really wanted, the same social warmth we would have when hanging out with our best friends. We should use those same social skills every time we are interacting with the public when it comes to helping animals. So by being warm and positive and outgoing and friendly and respectful, we'll be more likely to get them to listen and care. When the person we're talking to knows that we like them, we respect them, we're not trying to jam our beliefs all the way down their throats, they would be more likely to like us and to listen and to change. Lastly, our choice of activity as animal activists. You know, because there's so many ways animals are used and abused, there's many things we can do to try to help the problem. Many issues, many campaigns, many tactics. So how do we choose the type of activity that we choose to spend our volunteer time on? Do we do things that are funny or enjoyable or entertaining? For example, this protest from the United States where a limousine full of midgets wearing chicken costumes <laughs> pulled up in front of McDonald's and they got out and they began dancing around chanting, I am not a nugget, which I'm sure was very funny to watch. Do we choose our activities that our friends are doing? Do we choose to work on issues that are in the media right now? Do we choose to work on issues that we feel we have a particular talent for? Do we choose to work on issues that are personally relevant to us? Like maybe I had a, a dog I grew up with who I really loved and now I work on you know, trying to prevent dogs from being euthanized. Do we choose our activity based on any one of these sort of things? Or have we kind of, do we kind of take a step back and think of all the issues, of all the campaigns, of all the approaches, which one can I do that will spare the greatest number of animals, reduce the greatest amounts of animal misery. You know, all of us start off with the desire to do good, to be on the side of animals, to stand up for them, to do good in the world for them. But we need to move beyond that. So our focus is not just on doing good, but on doing the most good with our time, with our energy, with our money. If we think about the for-profit companies of the world, Coca-Cola, Adidas, and so forth, every one of them has a bottom line. And that bottom line, of course, is making as much money as possible. And so every decision they make, what to sell, who to advertise to, where to sell it, every one of those decisions is made with the bottom line in mind. If it makes them more money, they do it. If it makes them less money, they don't do it. We animal advocates 
we have a bottom line as well. Now, of course, our bottom line is not making money, but I would submit to you that our bottom line of every type of animal advocacy work we do is two things. It's saving the lives and sparing the misery of as many animals as possible. You know, if we, if we truly believe that every animal is an individual whose life matters, whose pain matters, whose pleasure matters, who should be free of use and abuse and exploitation, if we, tru if we truly believe that when it comes to their value and their worth and their right to, to live and be free and be happy, that a chicken is a pig, is a dog, is a dolphin, is a whale, is a horse, is a cow, is a sheep, is a bunny, that every animal is equal, as an equal individual, then I feel that we're ethically obligated to do the work that's going to help the greatest number of individuals, spare the greatest number of individuals from a lifetime of cruelty, regardless of which species they happen to be. And one thing this means, if we want to adopt this bottom line mentality, one thing it means is that chances are, maybe not for every single person in this room, but for almost every person in this room, the area where we can probably do the most good, help the greatest number of individuals, spare the greatest number of individuals from a lifetime of cruelty, probably most of us can do that most effectively by focusing on farm, animal, and diet issues. Now, this data is also from the United States, but again, the same trend would hold true in any country you look at. Now, this number is very rough, but what I did is I tried to add up the number of animals who won't be used, won't suffer, and won't be killed in our country this year as a result of the work of animal activists working on vivisection, fur, companion animals, wild animals, animals in entertainment. So if we add up all the successes that those groups have had, it's about one million animals that won't be used and killed this year. Now, that is fantastic. A million lives. That is absolutely wonderful. But if we look to the number of animals who won't be used and killed as a result of those encouraging and bringing about diet change, the number is 500 million. Not even talking about farm animal welfare reforms, which have helped tens of millions more. Just diet change alone, 500 million animals. There are 500 million fewer farm animals being raised and killed in the United States this year simply as a result of people changing their diet, thanks to the work of animal activists and maybe health advocates and anyone else encouraging diet change. Now, this is not the case because people working on diet change are any smarter or harder working or anything. It's simply a function of the fact that because there are so many animals raised and killed for food, and because every single person walking around outside today who is not vegan is contributing to the suffering and has the ability to stop, it's simply because of that that right now and for the foreseeable future, for almost every one of us in this room today, the area where we can do the most good, help the greatest number of individuals, is by focusing at least a good amount of our time on these issues of farm animals and diet change. In conclusion... It is bizarre, you know, it is really bizarre that we live in a world where any one of us should have the power to save the life or spare the misery of tens of thousands of individuals like her. You know, it is bizarre, and it's not right in many ways that any one of us should have that power. But the reality is that every one of us does. You know, it may be hard sometimes to persuade our family or friends to, to change their diet, but the simple mathematical reality is that there's some percentage of the public, maybe it's 2%, 1%, half a percent, we don't know exactly, but there's some percentage of the public where if you go out and you show them the cruelties going on and you talk about the health benefits of moving towards being vegan and you show them how to do it with booklets or videos or guides or so forth conversations, that some percentage of them will change. And if any one of us just spent maybe two hours a week, two hours every Saturday, a lot of Saturdays out of the year for most of the next couple years, each one of us, by doing that, would create enough diet change to spare thousands, if not tens of thousands of individuals like her from lifetime and misery. And if we think about, if we think about how you're going to spend the rest of your time this weekend, if you think about how you're going to spend your next paycheck, and if you think about the horror that we all know farm animals are enduring right now this minute on farms right here in Norway. Is there any better use of that time, of that money, of that limited energy, of that limited life that each one of us has? Is there any better use of any of those things 
than working to spare as many of her as possible from that life of misery. And the more we guide our advocacy based on research of what works and what doesn't, and the more we adopt that bottom line mentality, each one of us can be exponentially more effective, spare exponentially more individuals like her from that lifetime of misery. That's pretty much it that I have. For anyone who's interested in reading more about these psychology and social change, or the research on vegetarians and vegans specifically, because I'm traveling all around Europe, I wasn't able to bring physical books, but I do have these little flyers, which have the websites for the book, where you can go, you can read uh, part of it for free, and if you wanna buy it, feel free to buy it. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for all the work you were doing for animals, and thank you for coming out tonight. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nick. Now you have the possibility to ask Nick a question, if there's anybody who has any questions. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. I have a question about cultural issues when it comes to uh, like com commercials. We know advertisement is like Germans, they're very much uh, more attracted by doctors saying which toothpaste you should take while Norwegians are more affected by humorous, uh, funny ones. Uh, have you taken that into your account in your, in your book? Yeah, it's definitely something to consider. I mean, I don't, in the book, go through different cultures and how different cultures are different. And virtually all of the research is from the Western world. So Europe, mo mostly the English or partially English-speaking countries, as well as US, Canada, Australia, and so forth. So um, it, it may not, a lot of it may not be applicable, say, to Asia or maybe Latin America, places like that. And there may indeed be individual differences between countries. Um, it's really hard to know. You know. I don't go into those specifics in the book. I think that probably for some of these things, there's such an ingrained human tendency or a human kind of shortcut to behavior that it exists in all culture. But you're absolutely right. There may be specifics. I'm sure there are some specifics that do vary country to country and culture to culture. Hi, thank you for a great speech. Uh, I have two questions. One, the first one is, uh, do you know about John Robbins and his work? And the second one is, uh, I read that a very effective way in the United States will to have people cut smoking cigarettes was uh, they tried everything, you know, it caused cancer and people will still smoke and it's bad for you, but nothing got really a good change. But what really affected people was uh, teaching kids in schools about dangers of smoking and then kids would go home and say, Mommy, I don't want you to die. Please stop smoking. And then the most uh, parents quit at that time. So I wonder if the same logic can apply with, with animals and kids <laughs> and Mommy, please don't eat yeah. <laughs> a little <Yeah>. dolly <laughs> sheep or something like that. I wonder what's your thought on that. Um, I have heard of John Robbins, and he certainly persuaded some people to change their diet, and that's great. Um, as far as the latter, you know, I think, I mean, I'm not an expert on why smoking has declined in the U.S. and some other countries. Um, it has declined a lot. Maybe that's part of the reason I've heard, I've heard some other things that have worked as well. Um, so PETA tried this sort of approach. Perhaps, you know, they tried it in, in the, the PETA method, which is little comic books called Your Mommy Kills Animals, with the cover of a woman stabbing a bunny that they then went and gave out at schools. And I don't think that went over so well. Um, you know, I, I don't know if, uh, I don't know, I don't mean to bash Peter. Peter does a lot of great stuff, just, yeah, just funny. Um, but, uh, so I, I don't know, I mean, I would be personally very dubious that encouraging stu kids to go home and tell their parents that they were gonna die because they're eating meat, um, or, you know, gonna die early or whatever, that that would work because, A, because everyone does it, um, like, or almost everyone does does it eat meat. Um, B like while there is of course a link, it's much much le it's uh, less serious. Um, I, I just have a hard time picture it working. And plus like who would be doing it? Um, I mean I guess you could stand outside schools and do it. But you know I think I think it's very hard to reach little kids. Um, aside from getting them to just care more about farm animals in general and see farm animals as individuals, I think it's hard to get them. And I think probably our our core group is going to be teenagers teenagers on up, because they can start making their own food choices. Yeah. Hi. 
I wonder if it's the difference between people go vegan because of health or climate or animals. Like, do they stay vegan mm. for different? Good question. Do people who go vegan for different reasons, are they more likely to go back to eating meats? Yeah. yeah. Uh, good question. And the answer is there's not much research, but what exists suggests there is not a big difference. So again, it's not long-term research, but what exists suggests that whether it's healthy vegans or vegetarians, ethical, animal, that they go back to eating meat at roughly the same rates and for pretty much the same reasons, health, taste, so on and so forth. Uh, hi, I run the Norwegian Vegetarian Society, and I found your talk to be very uh, interesting. Um, one paradox I'm working with, and I'll be very brief on this, is that in some ways, if we say, well, it's great if that you have a meatless Monday, but we actually mean that if you eat one non-vegan chocolate a year, you're going to hell, then people will see that paradox. So how do you see how one can bre breach that to really accept people for having a one day a week eating uh, a vegan meal and actually including those people so that they're feeling accepted for who they are and not that we're just saying that to be polite. The people who eat chocolate one day a year yeah. or something? Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah or also just eat, you know, one vegan meal a year or a week for that sake. Ah. Well, so I think on both ends of that spectrum, we need to be positive and supportive. Mm -hmm. um, so people who are taking steps in the right direction like cutting out meat one day a week, we need to let them know that that is a good thing, that they're sparing animals. And then over time, like, you know, try to lead them to take, to be taking the next steps as well. But at the same time as again, like thanking them for moving in the right direction, doing something that helps animals. And on the other end, people who are like mostly vegetarian or mostly vegan, but maybe they eat, you know, meat once a year or like, you know, just very occasionally have these things, you know, they're v we as a movement or some people, some of us can sometimes see veganism as a purity thing. So you're either pure or you're not. And if you know that bite of, of milk chocolate crosses your lips, boom, like you're out of the club, you're impure, you're no longer vegan, like that's it. And I think there's a big danger in that, in that there's certainly people who maybe they've been vegetarian or, or vegan for a while and then they're in some situation, maybe they're traveling and they feel like there's nothing to eat and they feel like the only thing they can eat is whatever, a hamburger, and they eat it and then they feel, okay, I'm not vegetarian anymore, I'm gonna go back to eating meat. That is the danger of defining it as a purity thing and also turning people off who are, are close to it. Um, you know, it's not a purity thing. Like, every one of us kills animals. You know, if we drive, we're probably gonna run over animals. If we spend money on ourselves and clothing or vacations instead of donating it to animal advocacy, we're letting animals die. You know, none of us are perfect. So we have to realize that same is true for other people. And so if somebody is mostly vegetarian or mostly vegan, then they are great. They're doing awesome work. And we shouldn't be attacking them for like, you know, one or two times a year or whatever, not being perfect. So I think that the whole idea of validating what people are doing and not demanding, demanding perfection and criticizing if perfection is not there, I think we need to move in that direction as a movement. So you're saying, just to follow up, that one should be sincere in really acknowledging people and not yeah. trying to in a fake way, whereas you actually see them as being a failure for just doing something part way and not fully. Yeah, no, I think we should honestly see them that way. I mean, if somebody is mostly vegetarian, mostly vegan, and there's, you know, but they occasionally eat meat, like maybe they're only sparing 28 out of the 29 animals they could be sparing, but that's still 20 out of 29. That's a lot of animals they're helping. And so, yes, we should be thankful for that and praise them for, you know, doing such a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question is actually similar to the question he just asked, but uh, we heard some other discussions tonight about the kind of the conceptual basis for animal rights activism and what we can learn from other movements. And th if you compare, for instance, human rights and animal rights, the philosophical basis seems quite similar for the arguments people are making. But, and I understand, uh, maybe I'm being a bit of devil's advocate, but it would be hard to argue in human rights, for instance, that one ought to incrementally step back genocide and things, although it, may be, it, I, I don't, it might be a more effective way of going about some things and there's a different history, but is it is it sort of uh, diminishing the moral basis when you when you make co kind of a consequentialist argument like that, or, or are, we, are we moving to a different moral foundation? Yeah, so I think that philosophy and, and ethics and considerations like that, we should use them internally to guide what we do, how we spend our time, money, energy, how we live our life. 
But when it comes to the pragmatic decisions of advocacy, then it's a different area. So when it comes to human rights and promoting human rights, I would say the biggest question that any human rights organization should use is what is going to stop these people from being killed or stop as many of them as possible from being killed. And if message A would spare, you know, 5 million people from genocide and message B would spare 3 million, then I would go with message A, regardless of what it is. And if we look to human rights organizations like uh, Amnesty International or marriage equality, uh, you know, lesbian gay rights organizations, all of them do this combination, which I think we as a movement can do as well, of kind of articulating like the grander idea, but also working for step-by-step -step change. So Amnesty International works to get people out of jail cells. It says this person should not be in jail to begin with. They're a political prisoner. It's not right. But as long as they're there, you need to give them good food. You need to, you know, give them proper clothing, things like that. So they do both at the same time effectively. And I think uh, we, we as animal advocates can do the same. Okay, last question. Um, we are talking much about uh, strategic action and how to affect individual people uh, most effectively. Um, but I'm also wondering, what do you think about the potential for rational debate in those areas where you have kind of the basis is, is rational debate? Mm -hmm. For instance, in uh, newspapers, television and so forth yeah I I think that in situ that there certainly are situations where we want to use a lot of that I mean I, I don't know for if say for newspapers or television if we're using that as an example um, I would say that a lot of people consuming those mediums are not super rational and like thinking in a really intense way so I would probably use a mixture of rationality rational arguments and some of these kind of more surface level things that help persuade um, but, you know, if you were doing, uh, you know, in a, a meeting, like a long meeting or a debate, like, say, a philosophy club debate about it or talking with friends and you know you had half an hour to discuss the issue and you had time to kind of spread it, you know, get into those rational things, then a absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I want us to give a big round of applause for Nick. Thank you so much. Thank you Thanks. so much.